I want to begin by talking a little bit about how Microsoft ended up being in the place that it is right now. Uh, there was a Fast Company profile recently of the CEO, uh, Satya Nadella, where they explained that Microsoft sort of unlikely is now perhaps the hottest company in technology. Much of this is driven by the fact that Microsoft uh, struck a deal in January to put $10 billion into OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. And with that deal comes all sorts of advantages for Microsoft. So I'd love to begin by asking you, help us understand what the deal with OpenAI is about and what it means for Microsoft and perhaps more importantly, the customers of Microsoft. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, great to be here with you. Great to be here with the audience. and. Um, in Indonesia, uh, importantly, uh, as the president of ASEAN in the Pacific for the term, uh, having just wrapped up the presidency of G20. So congratulations to uh, the government of Indonesia and the Indonesians. Um, I, I think you rightly point out, and that article does cover the fact that it isn't as if we began press announcements in February because we got excited about something. Uh, it goes back to 2017. And in 2017, Microsoft had 5,000 engineers on AI. And uh, it was about the time that OpenAI was being formed as a not-for-profit organization. And um, uh, shortly afterwards, we added 3,000 3, more engineers into AI, and we created research, which then started to work with OpenAI. So it's been in the works for the last uh, you know, called a short of just a decade. Uh, and we've been working on many AI pivots, but most critically on ensuring responsibility of the product, of the technology and the platform, uh, most importantly, having accountability. And therefore, our AI principles on AI go back to 2017. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate to partner with uh, uh, an innovative platform like OpenAI. Um, and what we're now seeing is our ability to actually enable our customers, our partners, and governments to start doing proofs of concept. Um, I wouldn't say the technology is at scale today, but has the highest potential to, to impact at scale. I think people obviously paid a lot of attention to ChatGPT and the applications of ChatGPT. I have two teenagers. The first thing they try to figure out is, how it could help them take shortcuts and homework. I'm sure the applications for Microsoft and OpenAI are much more serious than that. So talk about how, how you as a company um, and with OpenAI, how you go about trying to make the technology real for those customers that you That's have. a fantastic question. And maybe I expand where we're here in Indonesia and I go probably outwards if that's okay with you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with a contiguous uh, situation that you just described, which is how do you get shortcuts? So, <laughs> and I, I'm actually, I think about it as massive productivity. So with the Ministry of Education in Indonesia, we worked with them for, open, for uh, Azure OpenAI to help create exam question papers, which is time consuming, a tad bit sometimes boring, uh, sometimes not very ingenuous in what we ask. And what this does is accelerate, create, accelerate outcomes, create immense capacity in the teaching system, and bring innovation to how questions uh, students are being assessed. Mm. Again, closer to home, uh, there's a, an AI-based startup called Jejak.in mm. that is in carbon trading. And with AI, what they have the potential to do is actually map 120 million hectares of agricultural land in Indonesia, which is, was a humanly impossible, but even, even in the past technologically limiting. But with AI, they're able to progress into identifying patches of land where more trees can be planted. Essentially, they have the potential to offer up to 28 billion tons of carbon credit on a platform in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, so let's expand our view now. Let's go beyond Indonesia where we're sitting. Okay. I, I was in India last week, and one of the e-retailers, and India is also driving very high innovation in the digital platform area. They have gone to refreshing their product stack on their browsers from every few days to three times a day. Mm -hmm. 
And what that has done, it's creating 8% uptick in their ability to sell more. Uh, a travel company um, in, uh, in, uh, in Asia is helping curate conversational holidays. So you can, so essentially what we're, we've been able to do with our customers and partners, Peter, is move from static product search to conversational search. Mm -hmm. So you can literally go in and say, I have a budget off, I want to go to the ocean, by the ocean, I want this kind of temperature, so much of flying, and it'll curate an itinerary for you. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, again in Asia, um, with Taiwan University, we've helped create a course on AI for students to learn English. Mm -hmm. Because we quite realize that when you have not picked up a language when you're a, you're, you're a child, you hesitate to learn, you hesitate to talk, you hesitate to speak. This, this creates a very private environment for you where you can actually communicate with an AI bot on your diction, on your pronunciation, on how you speak mm -hmm. in English. And, and these are just some examples of what have been achieved in the world. As we've seen some of the tech waves of the past, the internet, mobile web, many of the innovations happen within tech companies. They happen within a Google or within a Facebook. Um, with AI, it seems like the innovation spills beyond the boundaries of the tech industry. And it's happening in many other industries, including healthcare, uh, natural resources, as you mentioned. Finance is probably another big application area. You guys are sitting at the heart of this. Where do you see the industries being most impacted by AI at this point? Yeah, and perhaps, Peter, there are two sections contiguous in what you asked. The first being, we, will, we are a very strong platform for helping innovation. And what AI will enable us do is to actually live our mission of empowering every person and every organization to achieve more, i.e. empowering governments, empowering healthcare institutions, empowering farmers on you know, what to sow, when to sow. Um, and yes, banks. I mean, there's a bank in, in, in Europe that has looked at 46 different use cases on wealth management platforms. <laughs> but I think the, the other point you were making uh, uh, around how ubiquitous this could get, um, the, the intention of platforms like ours and some others that mm -hmm. will emerge should be to democratize the use of AI. Mm. But then the most fundamental enabler for that will be skilling. Mm. Uh, I, I've often, in my discussions with CEOs and, 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 and government ministers and, and government bodies, indicated that the barrier, or perhaps the headwind that businesses could face from enabling AI is the ability for finding the right people with the right skills. Something that you and I spoke about just before this. How does that, process work? How, how do you see organizations gaining the skills that they need to be able to take on some of these tasks, assuming that they're not able to compete with Microsoft and Google and competing for the best AI engineers who are out there? Right. That's a, it's a great question. And, and let me start with just myself. Um, yes, being an executive of the company uh, had a head start about what was going on. So we began to learn and I began to learn. But I, I, I read like five books on AI. Right, and I've said very openly, two I understand really well, two I, one I understand okay, two I really don't understand well, because it's so, some of it is so deeply technical. So what is the investment that any leader, whether you're a minister, whether you are, uh, you know, uh, whether you're in media, whether you're in business, trying to understand what this technology is about. So self-learning becomes very critical. As a company, we're offering a ton of content mostly free for you to log on to Microsoft, you know, learning websites and learn from them. We have partnerships with LinkedIn, even in this country, where we're allowing people to take courses uh, on, on AI. I, from an application standpoint, the application layer is perhaps somewhat less complex. It's the LLM layer that, that, that is more complex, which frankly, you know, people in this room, um, may not have the need to understand as much. So if you're gonna give people, executives, uh, leaders, advice on how to get up to speed on AI, what, what would be a couple of points? I, I can send that? a reading list. I'm not suggesting my reading list is comprehensive, but I've read, like I said, five, I'm on my sixth book now. I've done some training courses um, on Microsoft. What I've tried to do, Peter, 
is such that we have uh, the most appropriate view of, and as an executive of Microsoft, most appropriate view of technology, I'm reading both external content and internal content. Um, and, and that is opening up the aperture. I mean, this morning I was uh, with um, one of the ministers in the government here, and, um, and the, the, the question I popped to, to him was, hey, are you ready to legislate and mm -hmm. regulate? And do you understand the technology to be able to legislate and regulate? And can mm -hmm. we help you? Okay. You're, you're hitting on exactly the next subject that I wanted to go to regulation of AI. I feel like Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI, has been in pretty much every capital city around the globe uh, in recent months saying, yes, we definitely need some regulation. I think the challenge is you have different models of regulation that you're seeing emerge in, say, the EU, where they're looking after consumers. China, where they've already implemented some AI regulations that are very, very strict, and Beijing is going to be in control. The US doesn't seem like it has really taking even the first steps towards regulation. So what role should regulation play and how do the governments have to interact or not interact to get to that future? But Microsoft has been called upon and is deeply engaging with regulators around the world. Uh, we feel it's a deep responsibility that we carry as an organization. Uh, and we're actually part of a forum um, jointly with, um, with Google, OpenAI, and Anthropic uh, helping to talk to regulators about the need for appropriate regulation. Um, we have our own principles on AI, which we, which I said earlier was laid out in 2017 and refreshed over the last several years. We, which we are in truly in the camp that believes that regulation is appropriate because it starts to then provide the guiding rails of what we can and cannot do. I think what we would like to do is participate more with governments and regulatory bodies. What we can have, and perhaps I'm being a little bit paranoid here, but we can have a fracturous regulation across the world, which has the potential to inhibit the speed of, of innovation. Is it not inevitable, though, that we are going to have fracturous, fractured regulation, especially you're introducing these technologies at a time of intense geopolitical pressures, particularly between the U.S. and China. For example, the Biden administration has floated the idea that companies like your own won't be able to provide cloud computing services for AI within China. Is it not inevitable that we go down that road? As Microsoft, what we definitely see is that there will be other global platforms at scale that will emerge, and customers will make the choice of picking those that add the most value to them. Uh, this is where uh, companies will need to innovate. We do not believe that LLMs will be the moat of the future. The ability for companies, partners, customers, governments to use the application to use an LLM in real life application is essentially what will create great products for us. Great, great. Uh, we're getting some great questions on the screen, so I wanna ask some of those. The first one that I see here is about how does Microsoft view the risk of inherent bias in AI algorithms, and what steps can be taken to mitigate those kinds of risks? M Microsoft, uh, and I, I might uh, remind the group here, uh, started the AI regulation framework, internal regulation framework as back as 2017. This is much before people even had heard the, the name LLM or GPT, for, for that matter, GPT did not exist, which is the, uh, the platform that, that has been created. Um, Microsoft has 350 people uh, that's dedicated to regulation. Uh, and we have a responsible AI office uh, we, we truly believe that responsibility on what you deliver to the market, accountability for what you deliver to the market, risk management of what you deliver to the market will be some of the attributes which will be inherent to our success in the future. Okay, okay. I, I want to ask a, a related question about AI and how the models are trained. There's been a fair bit of controversy about the IP rights that are used within some of the AI models. You had a hit song from fake Drake who essentially stole the music, the melodies from Drake and was able to introduce a song that became a hit. Sarah Silverman, the comedian, the American comedian has filed a lawsuit saying that by definition, 
the things that AI models are putting out there are trained on existing art and then they produce something derivative. Is that the case? How do you wrestle with those IP issues as one of the key players in this area? So, so Azure OpenAI by design is a tenant that is controlled within the enterprise. So let, let, let's pick um, any company. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are many customers perhaps here in the audience or listening to me who are uh, working with Microsoft. Uh, what we do is we work with a customer on their data mm -hmm. and that data does, does not leave the customer tenant and we do not train on the customer data. Mm -hmm. This is a commitment that we have in terms of how we have controlled the product boundaries. Our focus is to ensure that enterprise data is mined and has, and has enough insight that they can make enterprises more agile and create more value for them. Okay, okay. Um, I wanna ask you a question. We were, we were talking before about where innovation in AI is happening geographically. Indonesia, you mentioned Asia more broadly. I think one of your colleagues said, oh, the most innovation is coming out of Asia. You have a global perspective. Help us understand how is the, I, I think, Peter, we're just very proud of being in Asia, uh -huh. <laughs> suggesting okay. that. Um, th there are pockets of innovation across the world. Um, uh -huh. uh, again, another public, uh, um, and I can quote this, is with uh, Mercedes, uh -huh. where we're actually interacting. We, our Azure OpenAI service interacts with uh, the, the car. Uh -huh. And so you basically move away from any human distraction on search to a voice to text search engine. And that's okay. all driven by human AI. I will give, share with you uh, another example, which is human to text, which is a very amazing example. So there is this, uh, and, and we spoke about it early in the year. Um, this is a, an example where a farmer in rural India picks a WhatsApp in a vernacular language asks a question, vocal voice question, about a subsidy program in agriculture that then gets converted into text. Mm. The text then uses AI algorithms and LLMs to search all the subsidies available. It then brings that back into voice, converts it into the vernacular, and is available back on WhatsApp. Mm. That is the power of AI. You mentioned one other example uh, earlier where you talked about a, Net, a Netflix rival and how they were able to navigate scripts. Could you talk about that in the entertainment? Yeah, in the area? entertainment industry, this is a very powerful example. Uh, I'm not sharing the name because the, uh, the name is, uh, is, is, we've not publicly disclosed it, but I can share the contours of it. It's fascinating. They're able to create replication of potential scenes. They're able to go through a multiple order of scripts more than they ever get got to. So uh, uh, because they're a, a very strong OTT brand, you know, lots of creative people write scripts for plays and, you know, multi-season plays and movies, et cetera, which frankly, a, a large fract, a, a small fraction of them, you know, they're able to review. Sure. Now they can review everything. They can then use that, those models to then help identify who would be the right actor <laughs> and have the highest right of success. They can actually do trials virtually of production schedules. Uh -huh. and, and, and so if you think about the amount of productivity that can be unleashed and the, the, uh, the sharpness with which you pick a script, align a character and how you produce it. Uh -huh. That's great, that's great. I, I, I wanna take the last couple minutes to talk about uh, leadership. Uh, you wrote a quite impassioned uh, post on LinkedIn, I believe, talking about how leadership in the, the post-pandemic era had shifted the ground a fair bit. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you've seen um, navigating first the COVID era, what some of those challenges were, and then some lessons that you have now as we come out of that era? Yeah, so Peter, that's a great question. And I might say certain things which when you go back and read the post, you might realize I may not converge is because I've been thinking about it more and more. Okay. <laughs> um, I won't quiz you. <laughs> right. but, but, you know, first of all, I, I joined just before COVID. Uh, and I came from a new company into a new industry, into a new geography. 
and I hadn't planned for getting locked into my apartment. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, it taught me to be agile. Like, to me, the biggest lesson of COVID taught me is how do you become an agile leader? And when circumstances around you change, how do you re-pivot? Uh, so I had to re-pivot how I onboarded. I had to re-pivot how I learned. Mm -hmm. And then I had to re-pivot how I engaged with customers. So you think about me as, as the representative of Microsoft in this region, I could not meet any customer. Uh, and, and the power of hu human contact, you know how powerful it is, otherwise we'd not be having this, this room full of people. Um, so that was one. The second was around, uh, I, I think that the bar on empathy just moved many notches higher. Uh, you know, if you were living in Tokyo and um, you were in a small apartment, which is normally the case uh, in, in, in large <laughs> yes. cities like Hong Kong or Tokyo, and, and you lived there, uh, you know, how do you find the room for video calls, like, you know, and then children in, in another room. And if you have a working couple, like, and I then began to think about empathy in a very different way. Like if people did not switch their video, it wasn't because they weren't ready for you. It's because circumstances may have been hard for them, right? Then the third aspect of, uh, of my, re about reflections on COVID was, how, how do you create, how do you create culture, yeah. right? How do you, if you're new, how do you learn culture? Mm -hmm. And we recruited 40,000 people during COVID. 40,000? 40, 40,000 net, okay. 56,000 gross people. Wow. You have to and teach they, them about Microsoft. How, how do you teach people. them about Microsoft? How do you teach them about, you know, the feeling of Microsoft that you only get when you connect with people? Wow. So there were many such attributes that as I reflect on COVID, COVID has given us a very different perspective around. Oh. And, and now one of the big questions for companies like Microsoft and, and Bloomberg is, how, where do you stand on letting people continue to work from home? Yeah, obviously you work at a very sophisticated technology company with every tool for video conferencing that you can possibly imagine. Do you want people back in the office now mostly or is it okay to work somewhere? Hey, Peter, look, we've been, We've been upfront and we've been consistent. We support hybrid work and we allow for employees and managers to jointly make decisions on what is flexible for them. Mm. There are situations where employees have had to come back five days of work, five days a week, and there are situations where employees are probably coming back less than a day a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I myself practice that. Uh, I go to work as many days as I can because of the fact that I enjoy being around people. Mm -hmm. And there are days where I just realize, I look at my calendar and I say, I'm just more productive sitting at home. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Microsoft has not gone into any mandate. Microsoft believes in people being mature with their leaders to make the right decisions.